Welcome to Grace Gospel Fellowship Sunday Morning Bible Study. I'm John Kirkwood, and this is the church where we, his people, seek to honor in God we trust. And I am looking through a cloud this morning, so give me a second here. There we go. Um, we are following the footsteps of the Apostle Paul from his confrontation with our Lord on the Damascus Road, really uh, to his uh, last remaining moments in the Mamertine uh, prison. And uh, we have left off in Philippians 3.10. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Now, I don't know about you, I don't want to sound like Gary Shandling this morning, uh, but I had one of those weeks that uh, could turn into a, uh, a Seinfeld episode in some way, um, and I'll spare you the details. Um, I don't want to kvetch and moan this morning, but it was a challenging week. I'm not... Um, uh, one of the better ones. And so, uh, because I am averse to uh, discomfort, I decided to spoil myself this week. And I um, treated myself to a, a shave. Um, and half the room isn't going to know the splendor of that. Although, uh, for women, imagine you went for a pedicure or something. A, a guy will go to the barber for a hot shave, and if you've never had a hot shave, you haven't lived. And so I went to a barber for a hot shave, because I hadn't done it in a long time. And uh, the woman there, her name was uh, Grace, she, she put this balm uh, on and uh, let it sit for a while, and it, it warmed up, and then she removed it with a warm towel, and then I got the shave, and then the warm towel again, and it was incredible. I felt like I had just been reborn. And this was uh, Monday or so. And uh, so the next day, um, I got up and uh, I went to shave and I didn't need to shave. And I thought to myself, that was some shave. Now, it did cost me $20. And I said to myself, that's kind of expensive at the time, you know, plus tip. But I paid it. I don't do it often. And uh, I got up the next day and I didn't need a shave. And, and then the next day, I got up and I didn't need a shave. And I said, wow, you know, I'm going to have to keep going back here. But uh, the third day I got up and didn't need a shave, I said, something's wrong. You know, I don't know what she rubbed on my face, but something is wrong. And uh, I, trust me, I enjoy it because I'm, I'm like Richard Nixon. If I shave at 7 in the morning by 9.30, I have a shadow. So it was kind of a pleasant experience. But I went back to the barber. And uh, I went to look for um, Grace, and she, she wasn't working that day. And so I was kind of sitting there waiting to get a moment because they were so busy. And finally, the owner was uh, at the register putting some coins in. And I went up to him, and I, I had to ask. I said, excuse me. I don't know if you remember me. I don't come here often, but I was here the other day. And uh, I got a shave. And he said, well, did something go wrong? Did you get cut or something? Are you here to complain? I said, no, it's, it was incredible. Um, but I haven't needed to shave for, for three days. I, I think something might be wrong. Uh, I just wanted to talk to the woman who did it. And he said, well, let me see your, your slip. And I gave him my slip. And he said, well, that explains it. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, you were shaved by grace. <laughs> and if you've been shaved by grace... Once shaved, always shaved. <laughs> True story. No, well, sort of. But um, so that that you know really came to my mind this week because I, I I did experience some some conflict between some brothers over over a subject, and you know eternal security is one of those things that people argue about. You know, believe it or not, yeah, it's not one of those solid things in Christianity that uh, we agree about. It's been argued about for thousands of years. 
And some of us take it for granted that if you're a Christian, you just believe, once saved, always saved. And, and uh, that's not, I mean, you're going to meet Christians who don't, and, and sometimes people will get in a heated argument over it. And it'll divide them, and they'll, you know, uh, they'll pass each other in the hall and not say hello anymore. They uh, will stop going to their um, dinner parties or what have you. And um, so I was, I was privy to one of these conversations the other day. I wasn't involved in it. I, I, I didn't superimpose myself into it. But uh, I saw this, and it got really heated. And I thought to myself, well, how unfortunate this is, because there was, it wasn't just a, a, a group of, of Christians, there were unsaved people there, and it got kind of heated, and it didn't end well. And, um, and I, I was thinking about this, and, and when you look at a scripture, when you look at a doctrine, for example, and I, doctrine is, is, as my father used to say, is the stuff that life is made of, so it's, it, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay its importance, However, the way we treat it is important, and the way we treat one another about it is important. And if something is that controversial, there's going to be merit on both sides of the argument, even though, because of the law of non-contradiction, they both can't be right. You're either once saved, always saved, or you can lose your salvation. There's no kind of middle ground there, right? And so somebody's going to be wrong, somebody's going to be right. And if you look at Scripture, there are clear verses that seem to teach once saved, always saved. You know, we're made of imperishable seed. In contrast to perishable seed, we're held in the hand by the Father and Son. But there are also verses that people will point out to show you that, well, no, you could, and there are some favorite pass passages in Hebrews and elsewhere, where it sounds like um, you could lose your salvation. So there, there is traction on both sides of the argument. The question is, um, how, do we, how do we make something out of this without really tearing each other's eyes out. And if it got, gets to that point, it's, it's kind of ugly, right? So I want to take you somewhere that might seem strange since um, we are studying uh, Paul's journey. But Paul was here, and you, you might not know it yet, but um, Luke 15 is one of my favorite passages, of course. It's the, it's the chapter known for the prodigal son. And I think that's an unfortunate heading, but I use it because it's immediately recognizable to everyone if you say, oh, the prodigal son, right? Oh, Luke 15. And it's like saying David and Goliath. People know the story. And so I don't want to correct the story and say the wayward sons or the lost son. But really, if you look at Luke 15, it is a cohesive lesson that our Lord delivers that isn't just the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the lost sheep before it's the story of the lost coin before it's the story of the lost son, right? And Jesus is trying to deliver really some precious wisdom here about um, a controversy that has come up. And the controversy is mentioned in the very first few verses of Luke 15. And here it is. Are you ready? Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Now stop here. This is the story, right? You have three groups of people. You have over, over here, over there, you have sinners. Tax collectors and sinners. And they're people who are despised by the people over here. The Pharisees, the very religious, kind of uptight people over here. So it's us and them, right? It's you're either over there or you're over here. But Jesus is over there. With the, it says, with the um, tax collectors and sinners. But we, we, we don't really pay too much attention to the end of verse 1, which is critical to understanding what's going on here. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. The religious people should have been drawing near to him. He was not only the desire and the consolation of the nations, he was the desire of Israel, and they should have known better. And had they known better, they would have been at his feet like Mary. But they weren't. But 
somehow Jesus was attractive to sinners. Now keep this in mind, because some churches get this wrong too. And some churches, trying to emulate Jesus, compromise their own righteousness in Christ to appeal to sinners, right? So instead of sinners coming to them, they go to sinners. And they become more like the world because they're trying to appeal to sinners, and they compromise themselves, right? And um, there might be a lesson here. There certainly is a lesson here. You say, well, how is Jesus treating them? You're going to know by the end of this chapter. So, some people think that you should go into the midst of sinners and really bring the the fire and brimstone and let them know that they're hell-bound and hell-deserving, right? And that they need to repent. And if they don't repent, you know, they're going to be charcoal for an eternity. And that, that's the good news to some people. I have a feeling um, that there were, might be people standing with the Pharisees who had thought, why even take that message to them? But some people, I guess there is a middle ground there between the Pharisees and the sinners. There is a middle ground and, and it's those who, um, who, who would compromise truth. But was Jesus doing that? It's a fair question. What was Jesus saying to these people? Now keep in mind, they were drawn to him. And the slander against him was, look at this guy. Look who he hangs around with. And if you believe uh, George Washington's principle that uh, about... Uh, the corruption of manners and um, those who you hang out with, you might have a rebuke for Jesus there. You're saying, look, look at this guy, you know. Um, and uh, a, 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 unless you, you understand that there was a purpose to be with these. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told him this parable. So the criticism was that he was even around them. And he was apparently partaking of a meal with them. Doesn't he know what they do? No thought here went into why he's with them. Just the judgment was that he's with them. So he begins to tell a parable. In other words, he's talking now to the Pharisees and the scribes. So you have to ask yourself, what's he going to try and teach them? by telling them this parable. You see, because this is a lesson, and this is not the lesson or the words that Jesus gave to the sinners, or at least the blatant sinners, right? The obvious sinners. Um, this is the word that Jesus Christ gave to the Pharisees and the scribes. So if you've never read this passage before, you have to ask yourself, what is he trying to communicate to them? Well, i got to tell you, the chapter begins and ends in the same manner. It just, one is in actual reality and one is in story form. And now we're going to see that. So let's go through quickly. First, Jesus explains to them, what man among you who's a shepherd doesn't care about a lost sheep? And what man among you who's a shepherd wouldn't go out and seek out that sheep? And if you found that sheep, you would bear that sheep back to the fold and you'd call your friends and your neighbors and your house, and you would rejoice greatly because the lost sheep is found. And you say to yourself, well, what value does a sheep have to a shepherd? Well, tremendous value. What are we learning now about the taxpayers and the sinners? I'm sorry, not the taxpayers. Forgive me. Forgive me, <laughs> Milton Friedman, for I've sinned. The tax collectors and the sinners, right? Um, which, if you want to know what the Bible thinks about the IRS, there you go. Um, so a lost sheep. So God views the lost as something precious and valuable and to be desired and sought out. If this is the very expression of the heart of Christ, should not this be the very expression of the heart of Christ's followers? Next story is of a woman, 
And I love this story because my mother had one of these necklaces with the ten coins. This is an old, ancient, eastern um, thing. They didn't do wedding rings back then, right? Um, except in, in Egypt they did, but in, in, in the Far East, in the Assyrian, in the old country, um, they did this beautiful necklace with, with ten coins, and it had a purpose. It was not only like a wedding ring, it was given to the, to the woman by uh, the bridegroom, but it was also given to her with the sense that if he dies... Or worst case scenario, they, he divorces her, he puts her away in divorce, she would have something to live on, right? It was kind of an alimony too, uh, um, or bereavement pay. So this would be precious to her as a woman's diamond ring is precious. And we all know, we've all experienced someone whose, whose diamond came loose from their setting and it bounded under a couch somewhere and there's a panic set in or bound, worst case scenario, you're at a picnic and it falls into the grass and... And, and you're in a panic because the setting's nice, but the diamond, right? So this woman loses a coin, and she seeks it out diligently, and she finds it, and there's rejoicing. And, and Jesus tells them that, there, that there's like rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who's found. With the angels, with the members of the Godhead, there's full rejoicing, a party. Right? It's a, it's a birthday party for the born again. And so he's communicating this truth to them. Now finally he gets personal. And he tells them the story not of a lost sheep or a lost coin, but of a lost son. And this is interesting. The son comes to the father. Now the father here, folks, is a picture of God the Father. Understand this. And so I, I love this chapter because this chapter, uh, you know, Oftentimes I've met parents who have tried their best with their children and yet one of them or two of them have gone astray and they feel guilty somehow about maybe the way they brought them up or if only they had done this and not done this. And it's really uh, certainly something we should all reflect on because no parent is perfect, right? No parent is perfect. But if you have an understanding of free will, an individual's volition and accountability, you could be the perfect parents, you could be the perfect mother and father, and do absolutely everything right. And that child, grown into an individual, can still indulge his sin nature, contrary to his upbringing, and uh, go into a far country. That's possible, it happens, right? Um, and, and so this gives some hope for the parents not to, not to um, completely take all that blame. But the son comes to his father, and he's not the eldest son, which is significant in this time period, because they practice primogenitor. And if you don't know what primogenitor is, let me explain using my children, right? Connor is my firstborn son. If we were practicing primogenitor as they did in the ancient times, Connor would get double the inheritance of the other children. And you say, that's not fair. Just because he was born first? Pretty much. Unless he was a complete slob, and I wrote him out of my will, like happened with Jacob's sons, right? Jacob's sons. This guy did this, you're gone. The next guy, you're gone. So uh, there was exceptions. But the rule, the rule was that the firstborn son got double the inheritance. But there was a reason for it. Because upon the firstborn son, if I died, it would be on him to take care of my widow, his mother. So he would have to take care of uh, Wendy if I died. So two thirds, or he'd get two thirds of the inheritance or something like that. I gotta, can't do the math yet. He'd get, let's see, I have three kids. Let me figure that out. Um, but he would get the, the, the majority of my inheritance because he had to take care of mom. Now look, I have a daughter too, Peyton. So not only would he have to take care of mom, but he would have to take care of the underage children, including if Peyton never married, he'd have to take care of her. If she never, he'd take care of her until she was married, and then, and then he was released from that. But if she never married, Connor would have to take care of her. So you might think it's unfair, but it came with a huge responsibility. But this isn't the eldest son. The eldest son is in the field. 
This is the younger son, and the younger son comes to the father and says, Father, I want out of here. Give me my inheritance. Which, it doesn't say it in the text, but the thinking behind it is, and this hurts, think now, the thinking behind this is, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'd like the seal, the seal on the will broken now so I can get out of here. How does the father respond to that? Now, the father could have said, you know, take your blanket and get out of here. He could have disowned him. He doesn't. He gives him his share of the inheritance. He says, this is your wish. You wish I was dead? Okay. Here's your share of the inheritance. And the son leaves. Now, notice, Jesus doesn't say the son left with the father's inheritance. Let's look at it real quick, just to point out a few things. And we're going to come back to Paul in a moment. So now we're with the son, right? And he says, uh, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property, God's property, the father's property, between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, all he had, and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property. It's his now. It wasn't a loan. It was as if the father died, because the father did die in the heart of this son. And he, uh, it says he squandered it there in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, you know the story. Severe famine, he lost everything. Now the party girls and the party guys don't want to hang out with him because he's not buying rounds for the bar. So uh, he's down and out. He doesn't have any real friends or real family there in the far country. He hires himself out to uh, a man of the country who has a pig farm. Now, Jesus is telling a story that's really going to get the attention of his audience. And the most defiling thing in the life of a Jew would be to be around a filthy animal. And the filthiest of all animals is the pig. Right? So this is like a punchline. If you're trying to make fun of a fellow Jew, you'd, you'd make... You, you'd relate it to a pig. This is one of the wonderful stories about when, you remember when Jesus cast the demons out of that man? Where does he send them? Into a herd of pigs, right? See, if you look closely at that passage, you find out Jesus was killing two birds with one stone. It wasn't Jews raising those pigs on that hillside. It was foreigners defiling the ground of Israel so when Jesus cast the demons out of the demoniac and they ask him, let us go into that herd, and he says, sure. <laughs> and the defiled pigs drown themselves and it, 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 well, that's another story. We'll come to it later. But you understand that, that that was the meaning there. So here, the guy's working with pigs and now he remembers. He remembers what it was like when his father was alive in his heart. And in his mind, he can't fathom grace. He's never understood grace, even though he lived with it for who knows how long. Let's say he was 18. For 18 years, he lived under the house of grace and truth, and he couldn't recognize it. And so in his mind, he says, I'm going to go home, and I'll negotiate. I'll offer myself to my father as a servant. I know I've, and well, the thinking is logical. Look, I've already taken my inheritance. I can't ask him for more. He's come to a humble, broken state. In his humility or humiliation, he realizes he doesn't deserve anything for the, from the Father. But maybe I can go back and he'll just hire me on as a servant, and that would be better than my independence in this far country, which I see now, is vanity. So he gets up the courage, and as he's walking, he's probably thinking of his speech, and he gets there, and in the story, what happens? The father is on the roof. Now, again, this is some cultural setting we have to understand. No one, if you've been out in the, in the Mideast, no one is on the roof in the heat of the day the most uncomfortable place to be. Now, you might sleep on the roof at nighttime, right? Um, this wasn't the winter because the sun was in the field. 
So you might sleep on the roof at nighttime because it's cool there. And oftentimes people would eat on the roof because it was cool there and they don't have air conditioning. So they'd eat on the roof, they'd sometimes sleep on the roof, but you're not on the roof in the midday because it was like torture. You're burning up. People didn't suntan back in the day. Right? All right. So the father's on the roof. What's he doing? He's looking out on the horizon. What's he praying? Well, some of this you have is conjecture, I know. Some of it you can, you, is implied. <sighs> But the father sees the son from afar off, and he runs down off the roof, and he runs to his son, and his son starts the negotiation. Father, I've sinned against you. And before he can get out the whole negotiation, he's awed by the grace with which he's enveloped. His father falls on his neck, Kid hasn't had a shower yet. Kid's been sleeping and eating with pigs in their defilement and has traveled a long way in the sun. He probably smells pretty ripe. Right? And you say to yourself, most fathers would say, oh, the I told you story, I told you so story would, would, would be maybe on deck. Maybe the first thing you'd say, if you're going to receive him and not say, you're done. I don't know who you are. <laughs> Depart from me. I never knew you. If you weren't going to give that speech, you might say, you know what? Go get cleaned up. We'll talk about it after you get cleaned up. Here's a bar of soap. Go wash yourself off in the stable. Doesn't happen. The father falls on him and kisses him and then orders something. And it's outrageous. It is. It's outrageous. The story is outrageous. The son who treated him in an unspeakable manner. The son who slandered the family name by his behavior returns home and is received with a reception like no other. Slay the fatted calf. Robe him with the family robe. That's the coat of many colors that Joseph had. It had significance. Put my signet ring on his finger. He's shoeless. Only slaves and priests were shoeless. Put, put my sandals on him. And the son can't negotiate anymore in light of this. For the first time in his life, the grace that he had been surrounded by for 18, 20 years, is now real to him. Scales fall off, and he sees his father in his ultimate glory. Now the story picks up with the other son. The other son sees a commotion, asks one of the servants what's going on. The servant tells him, your brother who was lost is found. Your brother is dead, is alive. Your father's ordered the slain of the fatted calf. Come and see. And the brother doesn't want to come and see He's furious. He's angry. He's already been furious and angry and hate-filled for the brother. He's not angry at the brother. He's angry at the father. And this speech comes across kind of like when Adam said, it's the woman that you gave me. It's putting blame on the father. And he gives this impassioned speech, and it's full of truth said, your son ruined our name, squandered your wealth, slept with whores, drank with drunks, and now he comes and you do this, and I've been with you all this time and you haven't done it. Let's just read this and then I'll try and pull it together for you. Ready? And he said to him, your brother has come. This is the father speaking. Uh, this is the servant. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... See, I love this exchange, right? 
This is, I do this to my wife sometimes, and it's my old nature. When my, my sons or my daughter act up, I say, your daughter just did that. It's our daughter. But I say, your daughter, can you believe what your daughter just did? So Freud would call this, you know, um, so he says this. this is, he, doesn't, he doesn't recognize him as a brother. This is an identity thing. It's not my brother, it's your son, right? So, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. See, see, he's telling the father that he doesn't know how to be a father. Because a real father would not respond in such a prodigal way. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Notice how the father fixes it. Look how he fixes it. For this, your brother. Now, it was the father's son. He could have said, my son. But that would be playing in to the error of the elder brother, not recognizing that it's my brother. Not recognizing that I should have gone into the far country to seek him out because I am my brother's keeper. Not mentioning that to see the fall of my brother in this fashion should have driven to my, me to my knees, weeping and in prayer for him, if I truly love my brother. But this is Cain. So, but notice this. Um, verse 28, go back to verse 28 because we skip it because the narrative is so rich with drama. We skip verse 28 and it's critical. It's very critical. Verse 28, but he was angry and refused to go in. This is the temperament of the elder brother. Notice this, his father came out and entreated him. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a real problem with legalists and I have a real problem with the self-righteous, they make me angry. This story makes me furious. And yet, there's a rebuke in there for me too. Because the Father goes out to entreat the self-righteous son. In other words, there's grace there for the Pharisee too. And it's a grace I wouldn't have extended. And so this story makes me feel humble as well. Right? Because the father goes out to entreat him. Now, it may or may not have effect on him. It may or may not have effect on him. Um, I don't know if it had much effect on those Pharisees. But here you have the, 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 the reason for the story. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus Christ is surrounded by sinners who have come to him like that son who was in a far country came to the Father. So you say to yourself at the beginning of the chapter, I wonder what Jesus was saying. Well, whatever he was saying to them, it's, it's depicted in the story as a father who was desirous that they return as a father who was kissing them in their defilement. Come as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You're there, but you're my son. You were lost, but you are found. You were dead, but you are alive. And it's worthy of a celebration. And if this was our heart toward the lost, then the lost in America wouldn't be rejecting Christianity as judgmental hypocrites. You know why? Because they see us not as the father on the roof or kissing the neck, but as the elder brother in the field. I bring this up to you, and you say, well, what, what possible relationship does this have to Philippians 3.10? The Apostle Paul and uh, Dr. Luke were very good friends, um, actually, Luke writes um, First and Second Luke, <laughs> or the Gospel of Luke and Acts. 
And some say Acts was a legal defense of Paul while he was in jail. Like uh, Luke was acting as his lawyer. Um, which is quite possible, because if you look who it was um, addressed to, um, most excellent Theophilus is, is a statement um, that a lawyer would write to a judge. That's the, the kind of language that he uses at the beginning of Acts. So it's possible. But the truth is, he knew Paul's story, and here you almost get a picture of the story of Paul. Now, when I've read the prodigal son, and trust me, every time I read it, I get something more out of it, and we're not treating it exhaust exhaustively today. But what I want you to get out of it today is when we hear a story like this, right? The narrative, it has good guys and it has bad guys. It's like a superhero movie, right? Superhero movies, they have good guys and bad guys. And the villains are villains, and the good guys are good guys, and never the twain shall mix. Now, now they're starting to mix it because... Um, a number of different reasons um, that I could go over with you later, but it's usually there's black and white. The cowboys with the white hats are the good guys, black hats, bad guys. Usually that's what you have. So when we read a sto story with, like this, we never realize, we never realize that the people can change. In other words, you can go from one group to another. The Apostle Paul started out with the Pharisees and the scribes. You know that, right? He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he'd pray three times a day, Father in heaven, I'm glad I'm not a slave. I'm glad I'm not a woman. <laughs> Sorry, guys, it was a sexist prayer, and, and, and ladies. And I'm glad I'm not a, a Gentile, right? A barbarian. That was the Pharisee prayer. And then Paul repents of that, of course. And uh, he says, in the body of Christ, there is no what? There's no free or slave. There's no male or female. There's no... Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ. He, he undoes the prayer that he prayed over and over for years because he's now enlightened by the Holy Spirit. But Paul started out as the elder brother in the field. And on the Damascus Road, he finds himself in the presence of a father who's willing to kiss his stinking neck and wrap him in the family robe and give him his signet ring. There is hope even for the most self-righteous, hardened heart of all of us. Just as there's hope for the, well, in this case, the tax collector, the harlot, the adulterer. See, so often in times, Warren Wiersbe wrote a book called Find Yourself in the Parables. So often in times... We want, we want to be the person who followed Jesus. Right? We want to be Mary. We, we don't want to be Martha in the kitchen who gets rebuked. We want to be Mary at the feet of Jesus listening. And we want to be that, right? How many times we read the story, we all want to be Harriet Tubman. We, we all want to be the one who risked her own life to go back, <laughs> right? to the plantation and rescue others. We all want to be Harriet Tubman. When that happens in real life, though, Few of us are. But we all see ourselves as, as Harriet Tubman, Tubman or, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Right? Or in this case, we only really want to be the father because everyone else has mud on their hands, right? But in reality, we could have been any number. We could have been all three of the groups in this story, including a reflection of the father. That's the heart we're supposed to have for the lost. But the world is rejecting Christianity today because they only see the elder brother. They only see the elder brother. Well, I think Paul was, was, was both sons. And so I bring this up to you because in verse 10 he says, 
that his goal is that I may know him. I started out by telling you of an argument I heard two pastors having over um, eternal security, and it, it devolved from there and got personal and stupid. And I, I tell you that because I think too many Christians stop with the word no. <laughs> that I may know. And they put the prominence on the no, and they never get to the him. And so they want to know everything there is about the dispensations and about the timeline and uh, about Bible trivia. And uh, they, their gospel... Their gospel becomes that. Their be gospel becomes the sovereignty of God, Calvinism, or it becomes uh, the timeline. Oh, you poor soul, you don't know that God works through dispensations? Um, and we lose track of what Paul points out here, that from new believer to the spiritually mature, our number one goal, is that we may know him. Uh, Randall Wallace, um, wonderful director, um, put this together so well in a treatment of man in the Iron Mask and, and with apologies to Alexander Dumas because it's not really anything like the book. Jack will tell you it's probably like the previous movies more than it's like the, the, the book. But, um, and that's going way back, right? 30s? Something like that. Um, but uh, the, one, it, the movie is wonderful. Movie, absolutely wonderful. Great acting, great everything. But there's a scene in it, and if I'm going to ruin it for you, I'm sorry. But it'll help me deliver my point, so um, shame on you. It's an old movie. You should have seen it by now. <laughs> in the ending scene, the climax of everything, all this turmoil that's been going on, D'Artagnan, who is the king's guard, um, and there's dark secrets that are revealed in this final scene. You find out that D'Artagnan is actually the father of the king, this, this wicked king, King Louis XIV. He's a wicked king. Um, he's an awful person, but he's D'Artagnan's son, and so D'Artagnan protects him and looks after him and prays that he will one day, you know, repent of his ways and become a good king. And you have all this... Um, uh, conflict between brothers because the other three, um, the other three of the um, musketeers are trying to, uh, they're trying to, they're trying to work out a coup where they can replace the wicked king with this imposter who looks just like him, right? The man in the iron mask looks just like him, and they just, they're trying to save France, right? And so they come into conflict with D'Artagnan, and there's a back and forth. But in this final scene, they're in this long room. It's like a bowling alley, and, and it culminates in this, this wonderful climax. And I won't tell you how it is, but young, musket, young musketeers have to face their heroes. And they're struggling. And then at one point, they're all standing together, and King Louis get so angry that the young musketeers won't fight anymore because they're in such awe of the valor of their heroes. They won't raise a sword. So he draws a knife and he runs to stab somebody and the knife goes into D'Artagnan's chest. And he's pushed to the ground. And D'Artagnan falls and they come around him. D'Artagnan has just learned this dark secret that has been kept for him, you see, because D'Artagnan, no one knows he's the father of the king. It was an illicit affair with the queen. It had to be kept hush, so they think it's the dead king's son, but it was D'Artagnan's son. But he finds out something else just before this, this final moment. He finds out that the man in the iron mask is the twin brother of Louis XIV, who was hidden for him upon his birth for his own protection because it was thought that he would be killed because of two dueling sons trying for the crown. And so out of mercy, such and such, he was put away in a far country in a mask to be forgotten. And yet he's come forward now and D'Artagnan finally is, realizes 
It's his other son. It's been kept from him this long. And as D'Artagnan lays dying, Philippe, the man in the iron mask, is angry at King Louis XIV for stabbing his father, whom he just met and he never knew he had. And he rushes at Louis and he forces him to the ground and he raises a hand to smash his face. And a dying D'Artagnan calls out, Philippe! No. He's your brother. Was he deserving of it? Yeah. Philippe, no, he's your brother. This is Randall Wallace's treatment of the prodigal son story. And in a way, that feeling you have toward the elder son in the field, Louis XIV, you want to smash him in the face for, for the way he's acting. No, he's your brother. And grace is not grace unless it's grace also on the unworthy. So we look at ourselves and we all want to be Philippe in that story or D'Artagnan or one of the musketeers. But in reality, at times in our life, we've acted like Louis. In times in our future, we may act like Louis in certain circumstances. The truth is, all the that the word teaches us about the ebb and flow on the human continuum of good and evil, we have the capacity to live out. The greatest among us, the most spiritually mature among us, can fail at any moment and become the self-righteous looking our noses down on the lost sheep or become Louis XIV, Self-absorbed. Despicable. And yet loved by his father. So Paul says that I may know him. And that is only real to us if the knowledge of Jesus Christ, if knowing who he is and what made him make such outrageous decisions if that hunger or that appetite is upset by anything else, even, even a greater knowledge of the doctrines in Scripture, then we have created an idol that should be smashed. This step for the believer is critical. This is not a systematic theology. This is a love story. This is a love story about the one hero, the one celebrity of all time, God who became man, the Father who came off the roof to kiss our neck. And until that becomes real to us, we won't present Christ in a manner worthy of the shed blood of our Lord. We'll present a system. It'll be no different, really, than Tony Robbins' system, other than it'll be sprinkled with some scriptures. We'll present a worldview, no different than many other worldviews. This is not a book of doctrines. This is the story of the person and work of Jesus Christ, and out from it throws knowledge that we call teachings, the teachings of Jesus Christ. And some of those are more critical than others. And some of those are orthodox, and some of them are peripheral. And none of them are worth tearing each other's eyes out over. Next time you are in a moment that's generating more heat than light, step back and reflect on the words of D'Artagnan. Philippe, stop. He's your brother. C.S. Lewis said, you've never met a mere mortal. And it encapsulates the idea 
that the worst person you know, on the worst day he's ever lived, uh, the best thing you could say about the worst person you know is that he is God-loved, he is God-desired, and Jesus Christ died for him and wants you to bear his love to him. Let's end there. We do have a second session, and I have to uh, guard my time. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to dive into your word. Lay it, let it truly be that labor that, that cleans us from the defilement of the day. We don't, we don't wash our neighbor at the labor we wash ourselves, realizing um, that we must sweep our own porch, that we must, uh, we must consider our own walk and uh, in relation to you, not in relation to others. It's, it's not that kind of a competition. Father, humble my heart, purge all that is within my heart that becomes a stumbling block to fellow believers or to unbelievers. Help me be both true and full of love, both grace and truth. In your stead will I draw breath. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.